G'day everybody, it's Danny here from Board Game Sanctuary, a place where we talk about thematic Euros, all with a quirky twist and an add of humour on top. Today we're going to be looking at a cool, wicked worker placement game, one of my favourite mechanics in modern board games. Today's game is all about ascending a tree, in fact, an oak tree, and dressing up your druids. It is oak. Hey Danny, what are you doing? Oh, I thought you said this game had a lot of branching decisions to be made. Are you searching for a leafy green Euro game full of branching decisions? Maybe you're looking for a game that will have you pondering over multiple possibilities. If so, then go to that broom closet, get out your dust and pan as this worker placement game will simply sweep you off your feet. Oak is a game where each player manages a tribe of druids who gain actions by praying at three different sacred sites. The runic temple, this feathery tickly one, and this Christmassy mistletoe looking one. Each sacred site has a matching moot action card associated with it. Each player has a copy of this card, which they use on their turn to pay for different effects if their worker goes to that particular temple. Each temple is partitioned into three different sub-areas as represented by these subtle stones. The more stones an area has, the more powerful the action you can take there from your moot card. The interesting aspect of this worker placement game is securing your place around the temple first, finding the right position, and then paying for the action there helps you to formulate your game strategy. The tension lies in securing the space that you want before the other players get to it first, because if you want to use a space already taken, you'll have to spend extra druids, and resources in this game are mightily scarce. One of the cool elements of this game is the moot card action system. One of the things I really like is that you can acquire these more powerful temple moot cards that kind of give you extra options, extra bonuses, and cheapen some of the actions on the board. The fact that you can still use the basic cards and also use the advanced cards means that your options becomes increased as the games progress. Now, just because the options increase doesn't mean the tightness of the game is going to change. In fact, this game is incredibly tight. Druids in the game at the end of the day reside in your pretty village that can be expanded in different ways. Players can add creature cards that provide extra rule breaking effects or even build shrines that houses an additional elder or basic druids. Artifact Discs provides players with 4 victory points immediately, but when rotated for their special abilities they're going to cost you victory points. A player's druid village is like a DJ remix board full of dials, spaces and actions. To become an Elder Druid, players will need to upgrade them using the Knowledge Moot card. There are five different Elder Druids and one special Elder Druid that can be only upgraded using a particular potion. Each Elder Druid has special abilities and cool clothing that makes them look so rad. The Arch Druids reduce the cost of an action space by two. The Bard Druids create extra open spaces for shrines and creature cards. The Ovate Druids cheapen the cost of brewing potions. The Talon Masters Druid allows players to reuse an occupied temple space, and the Recluse Druid doesn't take up space at your village. Throughout the game, players will also be sending their druids into the forest to gather ingredients. If players have the right combination of ingredients, they can brew potions to gain extra bonuses to help them reach their goal. Ascending the branches of the Grand Oak Tree is one way to increase your victory point score and gain extra resources. Players can play a moot card and spend three of the corresponding resource to send their druids up the tree. The tree is like a fork in the road. Decide which branch to climb up in order to secure extra victory game scoring conditions. However, it is a race to get to the top of each branch. Falter on your way and consider yourself a dead tree. I'm always impressed when a designer can take a familiar game mechanic, especially one as common as worker placement games, and put their own little tweak and design spin on it. This game essentially is a worker placement ascending upgrading slash card placement game. I really love the worker specialization in this game. The idea that you can upgrade your workers to elder druids and then kind of dress them up and give them special abilities and powers that allow you to tweak and bend the game rules. I also love the idea that as you ascend this oak tree that you have to choose 
how you want to score, what you've been going for throughout the game. Do you score based on the number of potions that you've created or the number of druids that you've upgraded into elder druids? The idea that there's branching decisions, literally, that you have to make along the way in deciding how to maximize the points based on the way you've played the game and the actions and the choices that you've kind of vied for is something that is pivotal to exploring the full depth of this game. In the game, one of the most important actions to take is to upgrade your basic druids into elder druids and thereby unlocking specific powers. Now, I found that in my game that whenever you upgraded to an elder druid, you only had a choice of one out of five druids to upgrade to and there's a sixth one that kind of has all the powers of the others, but you can only get that one if you're brewing that potion in your particular game. And I found in my games that I often lean towards one or two druids and use them first over the others simply because their powers more, were more flexible. There's one that reduces the cost of using a temple space and there's one where you can go to a temple space that's already occupied but without having to spend an additional druid and I found that I use those a lot more just because they were a bit more flexible I tended to avoid the ones which expanded your board and included extra spaces for creatures and sleeping spots just because they didn't seem to give me enough options in the limited time that I had in the game now if we're looking through the game through a thematic lens Oak is one that definitely resonates with me. It's got a lot of green, a lot of green, a lot of green, and more green. And I just love the fact that this game is all about growth. It's symbolically about growth. It's uh, magically about growth. And the idea that you're brewing potions and going out and gathering ingredients from the forest to gain these bonus effects, it just really has a great table presence to it. I think one of the things I really appreciate about this game is the idea that every druid in this game acts like a resource in some way. The multifunctionality of how the uh, druids work, the fact that you have to spend the druids and the druids uh, ascend the tree and the druids at the end of your turn after you've passed still go out into the forest to collect ingredients for you means that no druid is actually wasted. The, the theme in this game of brewing these potions and going out and gathering and putting them all together to make this eclectic mix of actions just really resonates so well with me. I love this thing. I just love having my little village board and the fact that each of the five boards are specific and um, asymmetric in terms of what they can focus on is really cool. And usually that's so cool seeing your village expand and then seeing the amount of creatures that you've acquired expand as well. And I think that sense of expansion and branching out and developing freedom is something that resonates through every aspect of the game. The best way that I can describe Oak is it feels like that you're weaving a quilt. The idea that if you follow the patterns through really well, you're gonna come out with this beautiful, marvelous sheet of fabric that you've created. The engine in this game never really goes to its full potential. Yes, you have these cool artifact cards, which I think are amazing because you can kind of rotate them and the fact that you actually gain victory points for acquiring them, but then you decide whether you want to spend a certain amount of victory points to use the ability on them. They kind of open up extra action spaces for you, as well as the use of these creature cards that give you extra benefits, conversion spaces, expansions to your board, ways to acquire extra resources just makes for quite a clunky um, experience. You're looking at these things and going, hmm, this is a particular action or bonus I could use, but how do I channel it with the resources that I've got? You always feel limited in what you really want to achieve, and it's always very tight. In fact, the game only lasts five rounds, and you think, wow, you could do heaps in five rounds, but it does take about two to three rounds just to get the cogs in your engine rotating. And then I think the game would really benefit from a sixth round and maybe a seventh round. Whilst Oak has a really basic and simple, easy to follow structure to the game, there's one aspect of it that makes it really hard to access and teach to new players. What seems like an entry level point of two this game for me feels like an entry level point of seven, and that's because there are so many different icons you have to wrap your head around, and this is only one of about seven pages. This page just simply tells you what the icons represent. Then you've got 
icons on the cards, you've got icons on the artifacts, you've got icons on the board, you've got icons in terms of what the Elder Druids actually do, you've got icons on the potions. There's so many different conversion factors uh, that you're spending most of your first three games with your head between the pages of this book. I mean, if you simply just look at the moot cards themselves, each card has four different conversion formulas. And if you've got three cards in your hand, that's like 12 conversion formulas. If you upgrade all of those cards, then that's probably like 24 different things you have to wrap your head around in addition to all the other things that appear on your board. And if you're teaching this to a new player, it's almost like teaching them a new language. This is a tough sell on its initial play and you almost have to kind of group the icons together to say like, okay, whenever you see these types of icons, this is what it generally means. You know, the icons themselves can make this game at first seem quite intimidating. If you're looking at the different play counts, I think Oak definitely excels when you're playing it with four players. At the three and two player mode, there are dummy druids on the board that kind of occupy some of the spaces that you want. And I'm not really quite a fan of um, artificial blockage when it comes to worker placement games because sometimes you want to explore a particular strategy and if those workers are in your way and they don't really have a reason to be there, it really kind of taints your experience a little bit. I mean, it's different if you're playing against human players and they're going there to get a particular action and you can really see their motivation. But in terms of just randomly filling up the spaces and then rotating around, you're like, oh, I've got to wait another round before that particular space comes through. Or I have to spend two druids just to get that same action. And that can sometimes not feel as satisfying as playing against real players. Uh, why am I collecting all these sticks? So in considering my final verdict, how does Oak fare amongst all of the plethora of other worker placement board games out there? Well, I wouldn't quite say it's a viticulture, but it's definitely one that I think would definitely grow on you. It is a game where if you can ascend the mountain of iconography that you're faced with and really familiarize yourself with the druid language in the game, then you're probably going to find the game an interesting puzzle to tackle. I think this is a game that really grows on you. One where with more repeated plays you become familiar with the mechanics and familiar with all the different parts that you can kind of see how you can tap into different playstyles to achieve what you want to achieve. And this game does have some surprising turns to it. Not to mention if you like dressing up your meeples, this one is definitely one to try. My score for this game is a 7 out of 10. And that's for people who play Euro games all the time. If you're new to the board gaming hobby, I'd probably say that this game might be more of a 6.5. Thank you once again for joining me for another Board Game Sanctuary video. If you really like my videos, I have a whole playlist of Euro games for you to check out on my channel. I would absolutely appreciate if you could support me on Patreon. Otherwise, consider giving me a like and subscribe. That's always free. And I hope to bring you some more amazing, wholesome board game content soon. This is Danny Sanya. See you guys soon. Bye.